The Silly Goose Gang Podcast. So episode 53 we're on now with uh, the Magic Marine James Stott. So James, thanks very much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me tonight. This is, um, I believe, the first episode that's been requested. Um, so a, a buddy of ours that we train with, uh, another military guy, uh, Lee Emsley, shout out to Lee. He he, he had said, uh, I think he had watched Britain's Got Talent and said, you have to have this guy on. Message him and ask him if he'll come on. Cool, man. We'll do it. So... When you said requested, I was, I was like, did I, did I request it? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, yeah. You definitely, you didn't. no, you definitely didn't. Hey, no, guys, no, can no. you get me on that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, no. Joe, Joe Rogan was busy tonight. Shall we go on the Silly <laughs> Goose Gang instead? <laughs> yeah, it was the first time any one of our friends has said, I think you should speak to this guy. So, um, oh, Spawn, so big thank yeah. you to, to him for getting yeah. me on it. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm here. I know that I know that those you know those guys, for example, were, were interested in the, the Britain's Got Talent and stuff. But um, me and Ali seem to have become uh, by accident a military podcast. <laughs> I don't know, how that, I don't know how that happened, but um, but yeah, what was uh, you know where did your journey start? In the military. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I joined when I was eighteen. I was going to say I think there's there seems to be a lot of guys, and especially a lot of guys from the Marines who were right now doing crazy stuff you know and if they've gone for the marines and then to the sort of special forces world like and you've got the SES who dares wins on on tv and then you've got like aldo kane who was a, a sniper in the marines and it, every time you look you're like oh that guy's a marine. he just had a marine on strictly come dancing and yeah. it's yeah they're sort of filtering out everywhere um, do you think that's um do you think that's followed uh, you know we you know because we've we've speak we've spoke to I don't even know how many Navy SEALs now. And that seems to have been a thing that happened in America quite a lot. That their guys, you know, they started releasing books and done all these kind of side projects that would normally not be done. Is yeah. that now something that's filtering over here? It's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a good thing for, good thing well, for the guys. Yeah. You've got obviously like a big rise of social media. Um, mm. You've got lads going into um, sort of after the military going into something else. And obviously a lot of Marines went into maritime security. Mm. And the money's just been coming down. So I guess looking for different things that I don't really know what would be the reason for it. But I guess things like rising social me- media, um, maybe like a re- reduction in sort of the maritime security world. So lads are looking for different different options. I mean, for me, going into magic was, I mean, that was a completely unintentional career. But I, no doubt we're going to cover that in the next hour or so. Yeah, well, how, well, let's go into it. How did uh, how did that start? As a young lad, I liked magic, but I was also skinny and shy and insecure and self conscious. And the last thing I wanted to do back then, you know, magic was geeky. The last thing I wanted to do was become a magician. So I liked it, but I was like, I better not do that. I'll just leave that there. Um, yeah. So it wasn't. I mean, I kind of kept half an eye on it and if I ever, ever saw a magician performing I'd be like whoa what's he doing but it wasn't until I joined the Marines uh, and I saw a guy performing sleight of hand magic and I'd I'd seen trick tricks with trick cards but I'd never seen sleight of hand skill and when mm. I seen this bloke just changing cards in front of me I was I was amazed and it just rekindled that that sort of uh, interest I'd had as a as a kid and and that's where that's where the magic started when I I went up to four or five commando uh, met this guy uh, and he he helped me out with it and, and that's where yeah that's where it started from from then I just kept practicing yeah I think um what what caused the the shift and the, the the attitude towards magic in this country would it have been you know you know I think David Blaine would be like the first guy who who made it cool yeah. you know you know dynamos yeah. dynamos taking on from there but you know certainly david blaine was a guy who was like oh this is actually fucking cool and yeah. instead of you know paul, instead of paul daniels you know what i mean on a saturday yeah. night television <laughs> i think yeah. that's that's uh definitely where the shift was with david blaine and, and dynamo and then obviously youtube came out just as dynamo was smashing it mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you got this this kind of street kid in a hoodie knocking out crazy tricks and baffling people and then it's just going viral with with youtube um and i think yeah that that just broke that 
that sort of barrier between magicians having to wear bow ties and be all weird and <laughs> yeah. magicians you know, are weird you know, do you know yeah. what I, do you know what I, I, I have to say this right now when i get off here this call i'm going to watch some old paul daniels stuff just to, just to remind myself how fucking awful it was back in the <laughs> late 80s early 90s when we were kids watching you know some magic on Paul Daniels fucking pulling a rabbit out of a hat or something. <laughs> but it, it was such a difference, though, wasn't it, from the likes of Paul Daniels that we grew up with. And then, you know, uh, David Blake and Penn and Teller were two big ones for me back in the early days. They were, like, the first ones to do a little bit of that kind of street cool magic, although they were still very Vegas, you know, with the kind of fast talking, almost yeah. that street-level style of, of magic. Um, I love Penn and Teller. Incredible guys. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, I can't even remember when the first time I would have been aware of David Blaine, but uh, he'd done something crazy, and it was just like, holy shit, this is also magic. And I think, as well, like, yeah, he was, I mean, especially that David Blaine, he does just weird stuff, crazy stuff. So, again, it's it's not, here's a card trick, or, you know, it's, it's yeah. so, yeah, there was that shift, yeah, big shift. Have, have, you, any, have you ever had a chance to work with uh, Dynamo or... or David Blaine yet? Um, I've met met Dynamo, um, and when I when I met him, I, I just said, uh, like, "Listen, mate, you your tricks." I, I looked at your stuff, so I, like as I as I progressed with the magic, I'd watch people like Dynamo, and I remember the point when I was watching him perform to Philip Schofield, mm. uh, and I was like, "Got you. That's that's what he's doing." And then I I then stole that routine. I still perform it today. Uh, so when I seen Dynamo, I said, like, the stuff that I learned from you, watching you, and I guess being inspired by him, I've left the Marines and I'm now a full-time performer. So thank you for that. Um, that was like the first thing I said. And do you, yeah, <laughs> I've, not, I've not met David Blaine, though. Do, do you, um, so when, you know, if you meet Dynamo and he's a bit of a, not a hero because that's kind of weird but uh you know a guy that you look up to do you ask for his opinion on things or do you just follow what you're doing and believe in what you're doing yourself um i mean not so much time i've got other magician friends who are, yeah. are if i'm struggling with something i find that they're more approachable and i'll speak to uh richard jones who won brit's got talent as a military magician a few years ago he's been mega supportive um and i can always ask him things and uh, I was sort of a bit apprehensive about talking to him because I thought, here's another military guy going into the magic world. That's sort of direct competition with him, but he's just mm. helped me out all the time. Um, yeah. And another guy, Darcy Oakes. Like, if you look at any of Darcy Oakes' stuff on um, from the Britain's Got Talent, like, he, he's doing amazing stage illusion. Like, I, mm. I wanted to do what he was doing, but they're like, no. Nah, Darcy Oaks has already done it. You, you, you can't do those routines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How um how small is the? Because I'd imagine it's very small. Like the the UK magician scene, is it very very small or growing? Yeah, it's the I, so I I'm not really involved in the magic world. I've kind of looked into it, and it's it's not been the place for me. And I've found a place for me is with the load of Marines. So I'd mm. rather sit with Marines and do magic for them as opposed to sit at a magic club and do magic with those guys. Um, and I think the reason with that is that the magic clubs you've got, there's a lot of people who are kind of hobbyists. And I wanted to speak to professional performers who were doing it because I, I ended up doing it full time. And I wanted to mm. speak to other about like a working routine um, because, you, yeah, there's, there's some amazing tricks which are really cool. But then they're not practical if you're walking around a corporate event and table hopping and that sort of stuff. So it's you have mm. to your working repertoire might not be the kind of magic. That's um, if that makes sense. That, that's that's yeah. that's really that's really interesting because I just said to Ali recently, um, changing subject slightly, but you know we we both trained jujitsu, and you watch some people showing technique on on Instagram, or whatever. Some you know kind of well-known guys and they show some techniques and you go that's awesome but i don't think that works in competition i, I think yeah. there's better things to work in. it's a very similar you know con sort of concept to what you're talking about there's the stuff that looks fancy and amazing and everybody goes wow but does yeah. it really work in in, in a competition setting and the answer is probably like, not do a forwards roll over someone <laughs> getting in some kind of armor, and it's like, yeah. i'm like hey bro let's try this but then obviously then when yeah. you when you're rolling 
they're they're trying to do their thing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, so it's quite that's quite an interesting. You know, it's the same same uh, same idea, just in a different setting. That, that you know what you've said there. So, um, so yeah. So, was there any you know because, you know coming out of the Marines, and um, you know as you said, you know the magic world was sort of seen as being a little bit geeky when we were younger. Was there any? Was there any uh, any piss taking or any shit talking from from any of the guys, or were they all supportive? No, it was. I mean, it was this sort of feedback circle of of joy, this this response that I'd get from performing magic that that I got from the lads that made me keep performing. So I, I would go into learning it, um, and I was playing about with it, and I'd say to the lads, "Hey, check this out," and I'd do some stuff, and it was that positive reaction, and I, you know. The way that I could just go to a group of lads and, you know, there's, a, there's obviously like a few low times in the military. Um, so lads get lost in their head. And for a moment, it would just break. Anything they're thinking about, it just break. And they'd be almost mm. like a childlike kind of wonder, just fixated on what I was doing with this. Like, whoa, what, how's that? How's he doing that? And then, and then it just created this happiness. And it was like this very positive feedback Um and so I continued to do it. And, and then it was, like I said, it was an unintentional career. It's because of the lads saying, you know that magic? Can you come and come around the mess do and do it around the tables? Or can you come to my wedding? Or I'm having mm. a, a party. Can you come along and do some magic there? So, and it was only when I came out of the military, I was, I was able then to say yes a lot more to, to these events. Like I, I didn't advertise it, um, but the more that I did it, the more people would ask. And, and that's kind of how... It just it just snowballed from there and and became you know full time full time with the magic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's you, pretty. Cool. Yeah, you could see you could see lads sort of taking the piss with it, but no, I didn't. They're always yeah mega supportive and lads are always gonna, lads are always going to take the piss whatever you do, right? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I think there is always that element, is it, when anyone shows a, a, a slate of hand trick in front of you. There is that bit where it kind of that split second where your mind just goes, "What the fuck just happened in front of me?" <laughs> like as your brain's trying to process that, you're like, "What?" And then you're like, "No, no, yeah. show me again, but do it slower, or let me see that again, or can you do something different?" It does ignite yeah. that bit in you, no matter how old you are or who you are or how smart you think you are or anything. You see it and you go, "Damn, that was impressive." And yeah. sometimes more so if you know the skills that are involved in it. Do you find that being a you know, a trained skilled magician now that you see things and although you can see the little moment where they do the slate hand, are you impressed by the skill level that they have? Yeah. To yeah. do that I, level I like, I like watching I like watching people perform. And I think so this is what like I don't perform for kids, but if I was to show a kid this mega technical sleight of hand routine, they're just like, Yeah. Because to a kid, a card can change to another card. Or it can vanish and be up here, so mm. they don't. It's it's like they're not impressed because they they accept it is that that's the magician and that's what he can do. Uh, oh, so okay. you have to be like a lot more silly for kids, and it's like that's not my style. But I prefer showing because exactly that way you know that I can't do that, and but you see it happening, and that's mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh yeah. Yeah, I've just I'm trying, I'm trying to think of a. I've seen um, I've seen uh, the the only magician I've ever seen live was in uh, it was actually in Ibiza, and to be fair, I was quite drunk, not quite drunk. I was shit faced drunk, and uh, I was fucking mesmerised. Just like, what the fuck, what yeah. the fuck, and uh, but yeah, I was. Uh, it's the only time I've ever seen somebody live, but um, yeah, it's something that's it's always super interesting. But you know, seen. You know, I haven't really seen the other David Blaine stuff, but it's just uh, so fascinating. I wonder if it's a like a mental trick or something that works inside human brain. Because if you know, I think if there was a magician playing or you know playing or or, or doing a show anywhere, you, you would probably go and watch it. I don't know if it's a like a curiosity of the of the human mind or something like that. I'm not sure what happens, but yeah. Um, because yeah, even so, in like you know in Edinburgh and Princess Street normally in the summer when you yeah, have the festival yeah. you have the guys yeah. out just doing it street performing literally passing a hat round for you know pound coins five pound notes whatever yeah, I saw one two years ago that had his own contactless terminal set up because he's obviously getting smart to the fact no one carries cash now <laughs> but even that you know they do the shout and you go oh, it's, it's a guy doing magic but you do kind of end up standing around and you know trying to, audience to, trying to figure out trying to figure out if you can catch him out and you usually well I can because I'm stupid. No. But um, 
you know, you, <laughs> I think there's that side of it as well. I'm not very uh, good at the the street side. I'm not very good at hustling. I remember the first time, so I was still serving. I was, I was working in North Devon and I went down to the beach and set a little table up. Uh, and I, I think I made three quid. Uh, <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't want to like, hassle people. So I was just like, yeah. hey, you can check out some magic if you want to see it, but I don't want to. I don't want to bother you. Um, but then after after that, I was in the pub with my mate, um, and I had like a little card box, and I was saying to him, uh, you know what just been happening? And this woman came over and chucked some cash in the card box and says, do a trick then. So I did a trick for her, and she's like, oh, let me get my husband. Got a husband, do a trick for him. And they said, look, we own the cafe. Do you want to come round for breakfast in the morning um, and do a bit of magic in the cafe? So the next morning, I cycled down and said, you're hungry? They did me about full, full breakfast. And I did magic in a cafe, met some met some great people. Um, and my mum was actually going to come down uh, to see. This was like, we lost lost my father. Um, so my mum was going to come down. I said, I'll put her up. And these this this couple that I met, they had a and b They're like, your mum can stay here for free. And it, it was just this massive snowball, you mm. know, just from literally, just just with a pack of cards. It, it's been, it has been amazing. It's, yeah, that's, I, I love stories like that. It's just super, like this... You, you you know going off topic again, but there's there's so much bad things happening in the world, and there's so much focus on bad people and and things that happen, and then you hear something like that and you go, there's so many absolute sweethearts in the world that never get a mention. So I love I love stories like that. Um, one thing that you know, just what you said that you know you don't like hassling people and and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and saying you were a shy kid. So how when you're a shy kid and you don't like hassling people, how how the fuck do you become a marine? Um. <laughs> I think what that is, so I'm this shy kid, I'm skinny, I got bullied, and I, it's, I, I was born in July, so I'm I'm like one of the youngest in the year, and as a kid, a year is a big difference, mm. so, you know, if you're, you're sort of one of the youngest in the year, like, another kid who's got a year of growth on you is so much, is so much bigger, so I think what it was is, like, one, I was always active and outdoors. So I love I love playing outside. I love climbing. Um, so I was very active, but trying to get away from this shy and secure kid, the epitome of like a tough guy is a soldier. And I think this must be what you know. So it's like, well, if I'm a soldier, then I can't be. No one can bully me then, or you know. So it was. I think that was the drive to go mm. into the military. Um, and then it's like, what's what's the hardest? <laughs> what's the hardest a Royal Marines commando yeah I want to be a commando that's a cool word I'll, I'll it sounds cool um I remember when I joined they had the, the sort of recruiting campaign saying 99.99 percent need not apply and yeah. um as with this girl and I said to her mum yeah I'm going to join the Marines you know I was told this 99 percent and and she says oh so what are you going to do when you don't get in then and I was like nah <laughs> I'm I'm going to be a Marine and that, I think I think as well going through through that sort of training and, and same with like Navy SEALs and anything that's super arduous, if your mind isn't a hundred percent set on mm. that's exactly what you want to do, it's gonna be real tough. It's hard enough as it anyway as it is anyway, but yeah, you really gotta be a hundred percent focused on that. So I think that's that's why I went into the military. And also I wasn't super academic, but I've got two brothers and they've both done uni and they're very very intelligent and academic yeah. blokes um but i was more physical it's, so it was it's it's funny because we've said so many times in this podcast that um ali's ali's a smart one and i'm like the strong one so uh i'm, I'm on your side where i'm not i'm not the most academic ali ali's the the reader and the and the smart one and i'm the one who could lift loads of weights and uh fight my ass off so <laughs> like me and my brother it's like it, when our little pitch video we we sort of said yeah very early on we we divvied up the brains and the brawn um but the only thing is is i've i took my brother training so he's he's got into bjj and he's got into sort of big compound lifts and he's he's about six three six four and i'm six foot so he's he's just massive so he's got he's got the brains and the brawn so, I kind of see myself there. Yeah, training them. Yeah, yeah, done yourself out a job. <laughs> done yourself out a job. Um, yeah. So, and then, so from from being a marine, you ended up in the SBS. Is that right? Um, I was attached to the SBS as a special forces medic. So it was after we had a, a tour of Afghan, 
um, and obviously it took a lot of casualties. And it was one of those things that I felt like it was, I don't know, like my calling, like lads were injured and I'd run onto them, deal with it, you know, square them away. And I thought this is, this is something that I can do. And it's, it's helping, helping the lads. Mm -hmm. So I put in to become a medic and essentially a trauma medic for, for those kind of ops. Uh, but I wasn't really fulfilled in that role. So I specialized again uh, and put in to be a, a special forces medic. Uh, and so I did a few more courses and then that enables you to work with UKSF. And I was drafted down to, to pool and work with a, an SBS squadron there. Mm. Uh, and I think it's the only job really as a Marine that you can be fully integrated into a, a special forces squadron uh, because everyone else there is a is SBS and then you're sort mm. of attached into it. I don't think there's any any other job that you're actually working with the squadron um, like like that. Uh, just yeah. just because just because you mentioned being a medic, uh, we had on a fact. I think Ali, you've got the hoodie on. We had um, Mark Omrod on. Mark Omrod. Oh uh, right, yeah. Yeah, Tim on, and you know he was telling his story about <laughs> you know the medic coming to see him, and it was uh, the story is unbelievable. It's um, horrendous, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh horrendous. my god. Yeah. genuinely sitting there going holy shit um and how yeah. cami is telling it um amazing really I'll, amazing so I'll, yeah i read us i was reading a book last night just after talking about being a reader you might appreciate this james with a military dark sense of humor that you all guys have and it was in a uh, jay morton's book yeah and he was saying about a guy a, a marine that was in um, the falklands back in 82 and he'd stepped on a landmine and it had blown his leg off and he said the medic was in putting tourniquets on and the guy was quite understandably upset and was screaming about, I've lost my leg, I've lost my leg. And then the medic said over in the darkness, he heard one of the guys go, no, it's okay, I've found it. And come running <laughs> over with the guy's leg. <laughs> 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 oh, man. That's fucking funny. That's Mark it's not, it's not funny some, some absolute drive. Mark, oh, you yeah. know what? An absolute sweetheart of a guy, lovely guy. And... Um, yeah, fair, you know, I think we said at the time, he's super thankful that, you know, we have those guys, um, you know, guys like him. Um, it's the only and, time and, that I feel like I'm getting good at the BJJ is when I roll with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> slight, slight advantage. How long have you been training? Um, I've sort of dipped in and out of it. So you've got a guy who set up Reorg, which is Royal Marines yeah. Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Uh, now, we met, we, we were both at 4-5 Commando in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, at the time, I wanted to go to the gym and lift weights. And if he ever pinged me walking to the gym, he'd be like, hey, do you want to roll? And I, I, was, I was like, no, not a chance. But it came out as, yeah. So then it's like, <laughs> we, we'd end up going and he would just, it just creased my neck. And it, it, it kind of put me off it. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I'd left the Marines and I was, I was down at a Marine base in, in Plymouth. I think I, I would have been doing a magic kick. And me and this other lad just walked past each other. Um, and we, we're from similar areas. We're both from the northeast of England. We walked past each other and I recognised him. But by this time, I, I got a beard. And we looked and we got chatting. And he said, oh, why don't you come and roll? And then, and then that was in 2018, I think. So then we started, started going. And then my little bro got into it. And we started. I was trying to do it a lot. But I travel around. Mm. I've got this, this, this uh, van that I converted into a surf shack. Uh, and I'd, I'd be kind of living out the back of this van, traveling around, and I'd go along to like just a, a BG, BJJ club and, and sort of say, it's okay if I come and train here tonight. And, you know, everyone's been like super welcoming and I've trained all over the country. Um, but it has been, you know, it's one of those ways I I'd, I'd want to get into it more. Mm. But it's, I mean, this year has been so difficult. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's so addictive. So addictive. Um but yeah, you know, if you're ever in ever in the uh, the Fife Fife region, uh, give us a shout. We can definitely we can definitely hook oh, up some rolling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's always so it's always, it's always funny to watch somebody kick Ali's ass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that'll be me. <laughs> I don't know. You mentioned surfing there, so do you surf as well then? Yeah, I got into surfing. Uh, yeah, again when I was based down in Plymouth, uh, not Plymouth, uh, in North Devon, sorry. Um, and I, I, yeah, I got into surfing and I just thought it's, oh, it's 100% amazing. Like it, it's, it's just so being, being out in the water. And I think it was at, so at this, 
time, like I lost my father and it was super hard. It gave like my whole perspective <clears throat> on life just got booted. And, and I, it, it was kind of a turning point. And I got into, I started doing yoga and surfing. And I, I tried to kind of leave the drink alone because I'd, I'd end up drinking a lot with the lads. Um, and there'd be times when I'd drive down to the beach at five in the morning and paddle out and the sun's just coming up. I'd be, mm. there'd be no one else in the water and I'd, I'd just have a little little surf and then go to work. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's fantastic. And the plan, yeah. so the plan was to, when I came out of the military, because my whole life was consumed by the military, when I left, I had so much freedom and flexibility. So I kitted out the van and I wanted to do northern Spain and Portugal and just kind yeah. of ride around the coast. And I thought, how can I make it sustainable where I could maybe out the back of the van set up a, a surfboard bar, do card magic and have a cards and cocktails bar, music playing and just just kind of like try and make it sustainable. Um, yeah, it's f- funny you should make that's kind of I not with the magic, but I, I used to surf a lot. I've not surfed in years, but when I was young and bendy, I used to surf. And uh, me and a group of mates basically went from St. Andrews up in the north, the uh, northeast of Fife down yeah through down towards Cornwall, Devon, down through France into Biarritz and then along the bottom coast and then up into Portugal over the course of about four or five weeks. And literally all we did was we had enough money to get us pretty much to the next town. And me and my mate used to play a lot of poker and we just used to go into the local casino and hope we made enough money to get to the next town. And when you're 18, 19 years old, you can kind of, it seems like it's going to be a good idea. But I mean, we didn't even have a return ticket to get back to the UK. We had to make enough money to get back. And we were away for about six, seven weeks, just traveling around eight. There was seven of us, a couple of vans, um, a motorbike, and we just traveled down and round through. Ended up like at the far bottom corner towards Nazare in Portugal. Yeah, um, yeah. Did not did not paddle out into Nazare because that is just <laughs> re- fucking ridiculous. But I sit, you know, in the where there's the lighthouse out on the point and Nazare yeah. breaks. We went out onto it, just watched the waves, and we all looked at each other and went, nope. <laughs> it's like a the biggest ad- now, isn't it? Oh, a hard no. Like the biggest surf I had ridden by that time was probably maybe 10, 12 feet, which is getting scary with the power of the wave yeah. when it hits you. And then you go out to Nazareth and it's it's coming up at like 50 feet and just crashing, like a mountain coming down on you. And I, I think, would... no, it'd be like that end scene in point break. You go and do it if it's your last oh. day and the FBI are waiting on the beach. But <laughs> other than that, that I'm not paddling out. That's a fast scene, isn't it? When he paddles out and he's like, Oh, we'll get him when he comes back in. It's like, yeah. uh, he's not coming he's back not in. He's not coming back in. Yeah. yeah. I think, generally, that's all I could think in my head when I was stood at Nazareth with my mates. And we all kind of looked at each other with that kind of, you know, that 18 year old bravado that you have. And you go, yeah. I could paddle out into that. And then you just hear it going, and crashing down. And you go, nah, I'm not touching that. It's something that I always want to learn. I'd, I'd love to, even now, I'd love to learn how to surf. Um, but. Have you have you seen the the documentary Under an Arctic Sky? James? No, I haven't. Oh my god, it's um, it's on. I think it's on Netflix. Maybe I think I bought it. Yeah, it's only about forty five minutes long. It's some American guys, and they go to Iceland to like the northwest of Iceland where nobody goes, and it's yeah. these crazy waves. And you know, there's a load of trial and error, and and they, you know they eventually get to this point, and they you know they end up surfing these incredible waves but under the northern lights it's just yeah. amazing you just look at it and go fuck that looks so cool um it's something i'd love to love to do one day but you know can't can't go knock you know i can't fucking stand up on anything so uh, <laughs> but yeah it looks so cool so but did you did you find the, the, the surfing thing like you're saying coming out at five o'clock in the morning you did you find that therapeutic yeah 100 percent. i think there's there's definitely so there, there is there is benefits of being in the water or looking at water, mm. um, yeah, and I think, yeah, hundred percent, just get getting up, and it, you, you sort of feel good for the day as well. Definitely, um, yeah. But yeah, I think there's there's definitely a massive benefit I, of. I get those um, I get those moments from you know you know climbing a mountain in the dark for sun sunrise. Um, you know, get to the top of a Munro, watching the sun come up, and just uh, sitting there, you know, going, "Fuck, man." Everything is good in the world. It's, I love that. It's amazing finding those little, those little spaces, whatever it is, to find those little spaces that make you happy is uh, so cool. Um, so yeah, sorry, I was going going to get a little bit emotional there. <laughs> yeah, we'll go we'll go watch the sunrise and that when uh, 
Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. So the yeah, I went up to Ben Nevis. Would that have been September? And just one of those things where I checked the weather, and the weather looked amazing. Like fuck, tomorrow's going to be amazing. So, uh, you know, my, my dad's got a, a Volkswagen camper van, so I use it. And fuck it, I'm going to chuck everything in there. I'm going to sleep in a lay by, yeah. in Fort William, and just you know, four o'clock in the morning, climbed it, and it was the 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 Monroe to myself. Just watch the sunrise. I've got a picture. And it's just amazing. It's just so yeah. so fucking cool. Um, so yeah. Um, there is there is that thing though, isn't it, James? Of being in the water because, like I said, I used to surf and used to go out silly o'clock in the morning, go out late at night as well. Um, there is something special about being out on that waves as the sun's coming up or as the sun's going down. There's definitely something special about that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I remember when I paddled out and when the sun was rising, and as I was breaking over the waves, and I'd be turning my head and I'd see. Like the droplets of water, and they'd be catching on the sun on the sunrise that's coming up. You know, like it, like a kind mm. of snapshot. And it was, yeah, it was, it was brilliant. And it, yeah, again, surfing, surfing late at night until it gets to the point where you just, you, you can't see the waves. We've had mm. it where we've, we've gone back to the van, um, and, and we can't, you can't see the number on the lockbox to, to get your keys out. And I, I remember I was wearing like a G-Shock watch. I was using the light on the G-Shock to try and shine. I was like, how, how are we going to get out of this? But yeah, I managed to, managed to get it sorted. It's, yeah, uh, super, super cool. I, I love the idea of surfing, but um, yeah. So it's, one thing that terrifies me, uh, James, is sort of, I do a little bit of um, open water swimming. Do, are you never scared by what's in the sea? Yeah. <laughs> um. Nah. Like I, swim, I, swim, I swim in local locks and start uh, like freaking out about sharks and, and is Nessie real? What if there's another Nessie? But he's in Fife. <laughs> Fuck! I'll just touch my hand. And I, I start freaking out about what's in the water, especially the sea. Fuck I, this. I, I, think, I think I have done in the past and it's, I think it's only natural to be scared of the unknown, which is what that fear is. Um, I surfed up at Trestles in California where there are, you know, it can get a bit sharky going up that northwest coast of, of America. Um, and but then you can't, it's you can't have you can't be focused on that and try and surf. The the two can't go together. Um, yeah. You know when there's that. Fear. I remember when I went out on on a tour, and I was I was sort of the advance party going out. So we're doing a handover takeover from from the paras, and we went out on patrol with them. And I was just watching the bloke in front of me, and I was trying to put my feet where he put his feet, um, and I was trying to like watch all my arcs, and and it, you know. And it's not sustainable to work at such a high level because you just fatigue, mm. you just blow out so quickly, don't you? Mm. Um, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am the king of average. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the the thing yeah. about sharks in the water is, is legitimate because, again, when I was out in Portugal, there had been shark sightings yeah. um, when me and my friend Easter went out there. And we went out for a, a late night surf as it was kind of getting dark, like you were saying, James. And we were all a little bit tense at the thought of the shark being in the water and potentially hitting us. And I think I've told Chris this story, but we're all kind of strung out across the back of the break. And uh, my mate uh, Eastie was about three people across from me to my left. And I just heard him give out the most blood curdling scream I've ever heard. And my stomach dropped. And then I heard like water. And I heard my mate Stu laughing. And he had swam underwater and pulled Easty's <laughs> leg on his board. And like, oh, it, you know that bit where you like kind of try not to batter your friend because he's just made you shake your pants. But uh, it was it was a moment of pure goal yeah. once we realised Easty was okay. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. I, I would call it a day there. I'd just be yeah. back in. I remember I had a bloke say to me, he said, if you, if you see a fin, uh, like, don't, don't flap, don't worry, because it could be a dolphin. And I was like, if I, if I see a fin, I'm out. I, am, I'm out. I will be like Jesus and walking on water. <laughs> Fuck yeah. that, I'm out. It's funny because we had on um, uh, Jeremiah Sullivan, who was a, you know, a shark expert, and, uh, an American guy. And he's uh, the first guy who ever, sh- who, basically, he, he hooked onto a great white's fin. And there's pictures of him swimming with a great white. And uh, you know he's going. Yeah, the thing is with sharks is as long as you stay out their mouth, you're fine. And it's just like, oh, okay, easy. Cool. Sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that kind of that kind of made me laugh. But yeah, no, I freak out in the water and, and and try not. And of course, when you freak out in the water and it's already cold and your heart rate's going and you you touch something, and you think, fuck, 
It's definitely a maybe, crocodile. Maybe you shouldn't try surfing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just stay out of the water. Yeah, I love I love dumb ideas. So, uh, but yeah, um, yeah, I freak out a little bit in the water. But uh, I'll try. I'll try and uh, I'll, yeah, I will try. You know, maybe maybe when when it's all over and done, with Ali can try and teach me some some soft moves. But uh, but oh, yeah, so moves. yeah, yeah, definitely. So. What um what what's the what's the future plans um and moving forward with the the performance stuff, James? So the the future it's it's kind of worked well with having this year doing Brits Got Talent because the future is then to transition into becoming an adventure magician. Uh-huh. Uh, me and my little brother we we sort of planted this seed of an idea when we're bouncing things off off each other and we're kind of a little bit lost and we said well what you know what do we do and what if we could just take away everything and just do the things we enjoyed doing, which we, we looked at and it was, you know, traveling, adventuring, uh, motorbikes, the magic and history. My brother's a big on the history and he loves kind of retelling the stories of the past. So then we thought, well, let's do, let's put all that together. Let's fly out to India, get a bike and ride it back and spend six months living on the motorbike, doing magic to the local people in the markets. And mm. I would be coming back on the old Silk Road. My bro would be telling stories of Genghis Khan, Marco Polo, you know, talking about battles. And, and also these like little remote villages, they, they'll have their myths and legends. We'll, we'll retell their stories. And, and we thought if we're doing all that, let's, let's film it and kind of make a documentary. Uh, so that's, that's the plan is to kind of have this magic myths and motorbikes trip um and we were going to set off in march this year and then obviously the situation changed everything's pushed right we're we're penciled in for march next year depending on Mm. which countries are open but that's that's the next thing is to do this adventure magic that'd be cool as you were telling that before you got to the you know the actual what you were going to do i i was thinking to myself it would be so cool if somebody went back to try and achieve these feats of um sorcery as it would have been called i suppose that'd be that'd be that's such a good idea i love that idea yeah you could you could uh travel the world uh try trying to prove or disprove these these tales of sorcery and wizardry that's yeah. fucking awesome i like that and i think i think again it's it's trying to see how we can make the lifestyle we want sustainable mm. so when we come back we'll then be looking at doing talks riding up to venues and putting on talks and shows combining the magic with the with the talk play a short film um and just kind of put these events on to try and sustain this lifestyle and keep just keep going um and i think we're gonna we're happy to invest a, a good bit of time into it and, and sort of smash that for the next couple of years and if it takes off that that's brilliant but if it doesn't then um we'll probably switch on to something else but i think with the doing stage magic as well i'm, I'm keen to do more stage pieces Mm-hmm. Um, like all, all my magic up until this year had been close up stuff and then when yeah. I did Brits Got Talent that was, I mean that's, when I went out on the audition that's the first time I've been on stage and it's you know 2,000 people and I didn't know if I was going to be able to perform so I just, I pretended that I was cool and I could do it and just focused <laughs> on what I had to say but man I was massively out of my comfort zone Dude, come on, like listen, like me and Ali are two fucking morons from small villages in faith <laughs> And we're speaking to Marines, we've spoke to FBI guys and, and doctors and all sorts of like we are so out of our comfort zone. But I think that's what um <laughs> that's what creates the magic is being out there and saying, Okay, I mean I guess it's not unlike being on deployment. Okay, this is some some shit that I'm not used to and it's either, you know, fight or flight. You have to you have to you have to perform. Yeah. Um, it's important to get out of your comfort zone as well. hundred percent. You know, this is why it's so, um, you know, it's so difficult. Uh, it's so difficult to do something that you're bad at, and it's so important for for your own head and just to improve as a human being. You know, everybody that we've spoke to on this podcast, we've we've taken something from them and learnt from it, and you know, hopefully we apply it to everyday life. But you know, when you know whether you start jujitsu or you or you start cycling or you start you know, climbing hills or you know, starting magic. It's so it's so important to try these things. That you, you're ter- like you should do something every day that you're really bad at. Everybody, yeah. Um, you know, to humble yourself and and, and make yourself realize that you're not all that, you know, great as you know, not as great as you maybe think you are in your own head. 
Um, you know, Ali Ali still has that problem with jujitsu, but um, <laughs> I like I like to take my shots at Ali jujitsu when I take them. But uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's so important to do these. You know, be uncomfortable. You know, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. Yeah, like Dave, David Goggins talks a lot about that. I think he's yeah, an absolute beast. I think he's uh, one of one of our top one of, one of our top three. Um, guess that we would like. We're never going to speak to him, but you know, yeah. we're going to try. We're going to try. Awesome. Um, it I think it's, it's important training. It's like discipline and, and sort of doing the things you don't want to do because <laughs> life's not going to be plain sailing. If you think from from this point now moving forwards that you're going to mm. have no issues at all in life, then yeah. it's going to be it's it's going to be pretty tough when something comes up. It's inevitable that you're going to have something come up, and if you Everyone, everyone is lazy. Everyone has that voice inside oh, yeah. there that says, I don't want to do it. I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to get off the sofa. And that voice will never help you out. And I think it's, it's just a, a primal mechanism to conserve energy. But we don't need it anymore. So you mm. just have to apply discipline into your life to shut that voice up and say, no, we're going running now. Not because... I want to, you know, I want to do anything other. I'm not trying to break break distances or pace. Or it's just literally trying to shut that voice up, get running, do mm. something that I don't want to do, but I know is good for me. Yeah. Because if I did what I wanted to do, I'd, I, I'd eat a brownie and chill my beans, and I'd just be, <laughs> I'd just be a useless sack. So it's, I, but I think it's important that people understand that if everyone is like that. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, just hundred percent. I said, you know, I, I said to to one of my friends, um, this is a while ago. So I I not always, but sometimes I pick the worst time of day, or you know, or you know, whether Saturday or Sunday will be a, a worse day in terms of weather that day to run early because it's fucking windy and raining and miserable. So you know, there was a couple of years ago, one of my friends came, you know, he wanted to come running. So I said, okay, we're going tonight. He's like, why the fuck tonight? Is like, because it's horrible. So we, you know, hit the local hills. And I said, it's it's fucking awful outside. But I guarantee you, when you get home, it'll be the best shower that you've ever had. And yeah. you will have the best cup of tea that you've ever had. So yeah. he, he looked at me like I was a lunatic. So we went out running. Did do a lot. Five miles, something like that. But lashedly, the, the, you know, the typical Scottish rain when it's coming down sideways and you know, as we say, blown a hooli. And, uh, uh, and you know, when he got home, he was miserable, just drenched, miserable. You can't get in the car. It's fucking awful. And then he did text me half an hour after getting home saying, that was the best shower I've ever had. <laughs> See, that's why you do it. Yeah. You should be thankful. It, it's, you get, it's so important. So I, I'll get up and it's like, so every morning I get up, I have to go for a run. And it's mm. like, I don't want to go for a run. And that's the reason why I have to. That's the reason why you should. Yeah. Um, Yes. So I'm just thinking now, James. Uh, on your um, on your Instagram, uh, does it say something about uh, doing an Iron Man? Yeah. So I, uh, well, I kind of got put in for it. Um, and it's, <laughs> that's an, I was like, that's yeah. an awful. That's an awful thing to get put in for. <laughs> yeah. It was when I left. When I left the Marines, I wanted to use a gym, and because I'd gone for, like I'd been medically discharged because of an injury I'd picked up in in the core. I was able to access the Help for Heroes gym. So I was like, can I, like, I'm, I'm a tight Yorkshireman. I didn't want to pay for a gym membership. So I've got a free gym there. I, like, I'll go down and use that. Um, and then I remember, like, the, as we, as, as we were someone, and they said, they were talking about, there's a, there's a uh, Dale marathon, which is, it's completely horrible. I've done it a few times. Every time I've done it, I said, I'm never doing it again. Mm. Um, and they were saying, oh yeah, I want to do this. And I was like, yeah, it's, yeah, put in for it, it's easy. I, I could do that now, piss it. And then it's like, yeah, I've signed us up for it. So then, then we're like, oh, shit, we're going to have to train for that. And I, at the Help for Heroes Centre, they said, oh, we've got a triathlon training. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do triathlon training because that'll get me fit for doing this this Dale marathon, uh, like this hill, hill hill run, which is horrible. And it and then obviously that the, the marathon then turned into a training run for the Ironman. Uh, cause I couldn't, it's, it's one of those where do you want to, do you want to do an Ironman? And it's like, I don't, I don't really want to do it, mm. but the opportunity is not going to come around again. Um, and I think that's, I just wish I, I didn't really train for it. So when I did it, I was 
it was so it's so hard. Um, mm. And I, I got over the finish line, and I took a knee, and I just threw up. And I, I've, I'm not, I don't think I've ever really been sick of phys- physical exercise, but yeah, I was, I was in yeah. rag order. I was a bag it's, of shit uh, after that. <laughs> it yeah. was, I found it pretty tough. Yeah, but that's because they're really tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not easy. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a park run. It's a fucking Iron Man. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I struggle on the park run. <laughs> I struggle with everything. I struggle with everything. You know what I mean? I, I think struggle. it's just because I'm that stubborn. Like literally every step, it's like just stop, just stop, and I'm that stubborn. I'm like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> just stop. Yeah. I hate myself. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> so I failed last year. I failed the Keltman. Um, uh, I don't know if you know that. It's north northwest Scotland. That's an extreme Ironman. And so I failed that last year. So I was due to do it again this year. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm in next year. So um, I have uh, left on my sticker that you you know put on the bike. So I've left that on my bike now. So every time I'm on my bike, I have to look down it and go... Puff. Fucking so yeah, I've got that next year. So when you say it's horrible, I fully understand yeah. <laughs> just how fucking awful they are. Um, so yeah, it's, and again, it's not something that I want to do, but I have to do it to complete it. Otherwise, I'll fucking go crazy. But um, yeah, I wouldn't advise anybody to do one. It's stupid. Uh, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. It was my my neighbour, my next door neighbour said, "Oh, I'm doing it, doing an Iron Man, doing Iron with Man with me. You're you're." You know, you could do one. I was like, nah, I'm never doing an Iron Man. Yeah. And obviously that happened. And I was out, I was out running and see my other neighbour. Um, and she said, Oh, I'm doing an ultra marathon next year. And I was like, <laughs> nah, not a chance. But now like all the time, like, hmm, I could do an ultra marathon. <laughs> yeah. An ultra an ultra marathon. So I've done a few, I've done a few marathons. Um, and an ultra marathon is something that I've no interest in because it's just it's just how how much suffering can you take? Like it's fucking awful. There's no good reason to. There's no good reason to do it. Nah. Do you know what I mean? It's just a terrible idea. Um, you know, it's, lot, all, you know. it's all the the horribleness of a marathon, but just for just longer. longer. <laughs> so, so how how do you how do you run an ultra marathon? Well, just slow your pace down so it lasts a lot longer and the suffering's more. Yeah. <laughs> sounds yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm with Catherine Ryan on marathons. I don't understand why middle-aged men suddenly feel the need to be exactly 26 miles away at the drop of a hat. <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible idea, man. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't particularly enjoy that. But it's, it's funny because every time I've ever done a marathon or any triathlon uh, distance, it's every time I'm doing one. At some point, I'll go, I'm not, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm finishing this one, and that's it. I'm not doing any fucking more. And then as soon as you, you know. You get across the finish line, you get a little medal and your little goodie bag, and it's like, oh, I wonder if there's anything on next weekend. Can I do one next weekend? <laughs> it's every single time. Every yeah. time. And you always say, go back for something else, but yeah, an Ironman's not, an ultra marathon is not something I want to do. It's and good once... to challenge yourself, though. So, I yeah. Mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you're keen on that ultra marathon, yeah, I'll, I'll do it with you. It's, um, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know if you've, have you got three days? Uh, <laughs> it's uh oh yeah I say, I, I, I say yeah. all it take all it takes is somebody to provoke me slightly like Ali to go yeah I, yeah I don't think I don't think you can do one anyway and then you go bastard <laughs> you bastard <laughs> okay where are we going but um, yeah, we're doing an ultra yeah we're doing an ultra yeah, I don't I don't have any have any any desire to do one but yeah but you know you never know you never know um but yeah it's uh. Yeah, I like you know, I like I like I like I like a challenge as well. So I've just seen um, you were up in the Cairn Gardens fairly recently as well. Yeah, we filmed the. I don't know if you watched on the Brits Got Talent when it when it showed on TV. They played a pre video, and we filmed that up in the Cairn Gardens. Uh, okay, uh, and that that was really cool. Like I enjoyed I enjoyed doing that. But that, that's what that I was working in Dundee. So this this year I had one event in January with the Magic, mm. and then all the weddings and events that were booked in for this year. Initially, ones in May, they like either cancelled or postponed to September. And when people kind of saw how long this was was going on for, uh, all, all the events just got got cancelled. So 
I was I didn't have any income, uh, and one of my mates from the Marines said, "Do you want to come and do some work up here? Uh, we're working out Dundee." Um, and I was like, "Yeah, just just manual graft." But I went up there for three months. Mm. But it, it's it's funny because we were put up in a, the Hilton Hotel in the city centre of Dundee. Yeah, and yeah. It looks onto a nightclub called Fat Sands. I know, uh, well, yes, it does. Uh, <laughs> as a young Marine, <laughs> uh, we used to try and go in there, and they're like, "Lads, you're not coming in." And I was like, "Okay, if you look at Fat Sam's, you've got an open air smoking area up mm -hmm. at the top. It's maybe four stories high." Um, so I used to like go around the back of the building and come over the roof and into the drop down into the, like we'll climb down. It's like a wooden terrace bit. Climb down the wooden terrace bit into into Fat Sam's, uh, and I. Was, I was chatting to one of my mates recently because it's so funny looking at it now. Like this is ten years later. Yeah. Um, I took a young marine with me. I took like a group of lads. I, I I know a way we can get in. Come, come around this way, and we're running along the rooftops. Um, and this lad, he just he just slipped over in all that slimy green stuff. We were so pissed, and he was like just covered <laughs> in shit. And I and then it got to a point where I was like, ah. He's gonna die. He's he's so <laughs> incapable. He was so done, and it like I had to like lower him into the smoking area. Um, and by this point, all the bouncers have seen us. They're all getting round. We're getting kicked out, but I, I just had to look after this guy. Um, and obviously, he got as soon as he got down, he just got chucked straight out. Um, and about I managed to jump down, and as soon as I got grabbed, I just slipped slip my jacket off and <laughs> straight onto the dance floor and I was like yeah I'm in <laughs> oh man that's good yeah it's uh Fat Sam's is one of those places where it's kind of legendary within Scotland I think uh, yeah it's uh quite a place quite a place uh but yeah it's uh yeah it's uh it's cool what what so what were you doing in the Cairngorms were you uh, what... so, so the Cairngorms was just literally for the the B, uh, Brits Got Talent filming. All oh, right, okay. Uh, because so initially they were going to come up. I'm in the Yorkshire Dales. They were going to come to the Yorkshire Dales, and and it would be it would have been so beautiful if they had come up here. Um, but yeah, I was in Scotland, so they they made the trip. They were going up to Inverness to to see another one, uh, another con, um, contestant. So they stopped off, and we had a day of filming. Uh, but that that's all it was, just for the this pre. Oh, right, okay. Oh, okay, right, okay. But it was yeah. it was quite cool. We went to a, a quarry. Um, and they're like, yeah, we want you to run around this quarry. Uh, and I said, well, I've got some, I've got some rope in the van. I could, I could abseil down that cliff face if you want, if that looks cool. And they're like, and they're like, what's the health and safety on this? Ugh. If you think you can do it, then do it. So then I did it, and they're like, I've not abseiled for a few years. So me and my bro set the rope up, and I was like, I'll give it a go. And I went down like, like not wearing any gloves, and I was like, and they were filming me, so I was just having to pretend. Like ah, you know, my hands were burning. Um, <laughs> but I went and got some gloves on and, and did it again. Uh, but I think yeah, it was yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. I, I was happy with the video, but I tried yeah. the video is on my Instagram. I tried putting up there, but they just kept blocking it all the time because it's like it's owned by oh, PGT. Ah, uh, yeah, fuck yeah, sake, of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, I think that would be the I think that would be the the quarry near Kelly Cranky. Would that be right? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think, I think it would be. I we went up there. Be. We met. We had some. They'd booked like some local drivers, which drove us to different locations. And all oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool area, man. Definitely. Yeah, a cool I area. used to live in Inverness, and I drive up the A9. Oh. And um... so were you? At, no, I was going to say you were. You been at Fort George, but that's a different fucking thing altogether, isn't it? I did. Oh. I did go to Fort George. I have been there before. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. It's um. Yeah, Inverness is cool. Um. It's always uh yeah, it's always cool to go up there up to up the A nine. Um the road's terrible obviously, but yeah, it's a cool place it's a cool place to go and spend some time. I think um I don't I don't I, I think more people should spend some time in the Highlands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. De definitely should. Fucking I took, I took the van up to the the Isle of Sky. Um, oh, I love Sky. <laughs> and I was I was like living in the van, like swimming in the like the little waterfall bits. Yeah. And there's this this old gnarly marine um, who lives up there, and he works for Sky Mountain Rescue. And my mm. mate was was like, "Yeah, you've got to find him." And I was like, "Where do I find him?" To so go go to the old inn next to the Taliska place, mm -hmm. and he'll be at the bar. So like, I went I went to the bar. I said, I'm looking for Jonah, and he's there at the bar. And we got chatting. And I said I was a marine, um, 
and they said, do you, want, do you want to go up, do you want to do the inaccessible pinnacle? Do you want to go up the Coolins? Mm. Uh, like what you're doing on Sunday? I was like, I'm free. Yeah. So it, he then took, took me up and we climbed that. Um, yeah, I wish, I, I, I wish I knew how to, to properly climb because I'd love to go up that. That looks um, that looks amazing. That looks really cool. Uh, but yeah, I love Sky. Sky is such a fucking yeah. cool place. I really yeah. love Sky. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's. Um, I, I know Sky is like the obviously the the kind of that's the one everyone knows. Like when when we we're younger, my my parents would take us up. We did a lot of uh, trips up to Scotland and a mm. lot of cycling uh, in the Outer Hebrides and, you know, South Uist, North Uist and Battersea and did like a lot more of the, the little islands. Uh, yeah. And I, I know Sky and Muller, the sort of notorious ones that everyone, you know. Yeah, quite, yeah. Quite I'm actually, I'm from slightly further south than those. I'm on the the, Hebr- the Clyde Islands. I'm from Arran. I don't know if you ever went across oh, to there. Yeah, yeah. I'm from, I'm from Arran originally, yeah. So I've got a wee nice place in my heart for the islands, yeah. Yeah, yeah, spawn except for the midges. <laughs> well, my dad, my dad's from my dad's from Bristol originally, and he used to come back from walking up Glen Rose on Arran and up on the Goat Fell and along the the Warrior and stuff, and come back, and his back would be like braille, and we used to blame <laughs> it on his weak English blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must have that. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, none of us ever used to get, but we'd get a couple of them. And honestly, my bad—if you were blind, you could have read my dad's back. It was horrific, eh? yeah. absolutely horrific. Oh man, yeah, it's funny. Um, well, guys, I am now running out of intelligent things to say. Is that, that about? It's about that time when I'm running out of intelligent yeah, things to say. So, um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a, 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 an absolute pleasure. If you're, um, you know, if you find yourself up this way. Um, absolutely, give us a shout. We could we could roll and uh, yeah, def- good. definitely climb, yeah. definitely climb a hill if you if you want to. Um, that'd be awesome. So yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for your time, man. It's uh, been 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 good. Well, thank just you for before we done. before we wind up, James, just so we can give you a shout out as well. If people want to find out more about you or or look up any of your social media websites, if you give them a shout out, and I'll tag all these in the video when I post it on YouTube as well. Ah, oh, brilliant! Yeah, it's a. I think everything's just the magic marine, um, but you have to put you have to put the in the the magic marine. Yeah. Uh, I, I I giggled magic marine earlier on. I was looking at some fucking weird uh, uh, like marine stuff. Sailing company, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, apparently, if somebody's looking for a really good sail, magic marine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think yeah, pretty much. I mean, Instagram's like my main platform. I. I I struggle enough just with that one. So trying to do anything else is, is yeah, yeah I, I kind of maxed out just on Instagram. Uh, yeah. But that's, yeah, James Steele Stott um, or, or the, the Magic Marine. I think if you just search the, the Magic Marine, it comes up. Cool. We'll tag that in as well. But yeah, thanks very much. As I say, appreciate you taking the time and jumping in, mate. It's been a, a fun hour and a, a exactly, good chat that yeah. we've had. So it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, actually all, it's, all, it's actually always difficult to get British people to speak to us. Americans can't wait. But nobody that's British ever wants to speak to us, so thank you. <laughs> uh, it's been good chatting to you, lads. Thank, thanks for having me on. No, oh, anytime, anytime. And as I say, if you're ever up in the Kingdom of Fife, give us a shout, and we'll uh, we'll swim in the sea, we'll climb a mountain, and we'll rope whatever needs done. We'll have a laugh. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. Ideal. Awesome. Thank yeah, well, epi- thanks very much, James. Episode fifty-three is done and dusted. Silly Goose Gang Podcast.